<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Brothers of Deconstruction podcast, where we, the Brothers of Deconstruction, go over this week in the WWE. The Brothers of Deconstruction are an affiliate of the Busted Zipper Entertainment Network. If you would like to hear more from Busted Zipper, please check us out at Busted Zipper on YouTube and Busted Zipper on Twitter. Uh, We've got a lot of good podcasts, some short films that are working on. Uh, Please feel free to check this out. Uh, The Brothers of Deconstruction are myself. My name is Taylor. You can follow me at at Bergtay, B-U-R-G-T-A-Y on Twitter. And then I'm always joined by my brother, Phil. What's up, Phil? I am your brother and I am here. Yes, all of these are true statements. Thanks, Phil. This week is a special week in the Brothers of Deconstruction podcast because it is the week after the Royal Rumble, which means we, Phil and I, get to speak about what is annually our favorite pay-per-view, the Royal Rumble. So I love the Rumble so much. It's so good. You will never forget the Rumble. Was r- this year's Rumble. good? You, you always remember the Rumble. That's remember one the, the Rumble. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag remember the Rumble. Friend versus friend. Foe versus foe. Hashtag. <laughs> Hashtag over the ropes. Two feet. And so this week we <laughs> are going to talk about... NXT TakeOver San Antonio, the Royal Rumble pay-per-view itself, and the Raw and SmackDown following that Royal Rumble. The basic way we're going to talk today is for each show, we're going to have our highs, which is the best part of that show, our low, which is the worst part of the show in our opinion, and then our hot take, which is our sort of overall feeling of how we thought the show was going or how the overall arcing storylines in WWE are headed at this moment. And without further ado, unless, Phil, you've got something you want to add. Uh, the Royal Rimble. Okay, without further ado, let's move on and start with NXT TakeOver San Antonio. Uh, NXT usually puts on really really good shows when these takeovers happen a day before uh the major pay-per-view uh the brooklyn shows before SummerSlam have been good uh last year before uh the dallas wrestlemania may have my favorite match of all time in it um so nxt is notoriously good uh and with that comes probably some really easy highs to find and some and some lows so, Phil, I'll start off first with my high for NXT TakeOver San Antonio. I had a very low bar for because I thought, you know, multi-women match. You know, I didn't really know much about, you know, is are Peyton Royce and Billy Kay really up to snuff with Asuka? And I, I knew nothing about uh, that lady from Sanity. It... There was a lot that could have gone wrong in this match, and yet it was probably the best match on the card. I I, I loved it. Uh, each woman looked strong in the match, but no one looked stronger than Asuka. See, the NXT's having this problem now because Asuka is such a crazy destroyer that it's almost impossible to find another woman that has any any feel like she's going to overtake Asuka in any way. Uh, but with this multi-women match, she could have been ganged up on, especially with the Peyton Royce and Billy Kay working together. And, you know, they added intrigue in a way to make it feel like Asuka maybe would lose the title. We all knew she wouldn't, and in the end she didn't. But for... A low bar that I set for it, they surpassed what I thought they could do miles above what I thought. What do you think, Phil? Well, tell you, you took you took my high as well. And normally in this situation, I'm inclined to pick something else, my, to pick my second favorite so that we don't agree on something. But I think this match deserves it. I think it deserves both of our highs because I 100% agree with everything you said. Um, the, the, the Peyton Manning and Royce Taylor. Yeah, um, nailed it. Those two together were... What? You nailed it. You nailed. Yep, that was definitely the yeah, names. Yeah, no, that's I. I'm I'm good at names. I'm good at names. Um, it was it was an idea that shouldn't have worked, but it did. And the reason for it was because 
Um, they for I think the first time I've ever seen one of these matches, they were two people who came out and said we're going to work together and we're not going to betray each other. And they worked together, and they didn't betray each other, and them combined together was a legit threat to the other two clearly, like, superior competitors, um, which was awesome, which which added a really cool dynamic to it. I think I told you that I, I, I kind of wish there had been a bit of the match where one of them had just lied down and tried to let the other one pin them, um, but that would have been maybe too hard to break up given the, like, ludicrous spots and massive damage that the women in that match were taking. Um... Nikki Cross, this was kind of her big coming out party. Like, hey, let's let's see what this person can do. We're going to fling her pretty much immediately into uh, a main event uh, uh, spot with, with Asuka and the other two. And uh, she performed really well. Not afraid to take the high spots. Not afraid um, to get, just get battered. Um, and she really came across as kind of a monster that they had to pull out all stops in order to in order to, to, to stop like I, I it was one of those things where they put her through that table and I was like anything short of that anything short of putting her through a table or some other massive damage thing would not have taken that person out of the match uh, and then of course Asuka like being the dominant monster that she is really played up well and and you're right like Asuka for a long time I, I'd say even Probably since Bailey left. Like, I mean, as much as I enjoyed Mickey James coming back, I don't really, never really felt like she was a threat to Asuka. But there was a part of that match where I was honestly like, you know, I can, I can feasibly see Asuka losing that match. Maybe not necessarily taking the pin, but being disabled in such a way where someone else takes a pin and she loses the belt. So, um, I, I was interested in the match. The match itself was very exciting and entertaining. Um, and it kind of proved, hey, you know, the, the NXT women's division, we're, we're not gone. We're not dead. We still have um, stuff that we can give to you. I, I kind of, there's a part of me that kind of hopes that um, Peyton Manning and Billy Kidman stay <laughs> as the, the team together. Like, they, they are only able to compete at the same time because something about that just, I don't know. It, it's really like take two people who are maybe a little weaker for, in all regards to the other competitors in the women's division, have them wrestle together all the time. Not only is that like hiding their weaknesses pretty well, but that's a pretty great heel move to basically to somehow figure out a way where they're constantly having handicap matches with people who should technically be beating them but can't because of that stipulation. I don't know. It, it, was, it was cool. It was enjoyable. Um, like I was making like I, I, I when I first started uh, watching that match the first time and because I, I watched that match more than once, um, I was on my phone. I, I wasn't really paying attention. Uh, and then I can't remember what it was. I feel like it was one of the suplexes at the beginning of the match made me look up with like this expression like, oh, oh, I can't believe they did that. OK, I'm going to pay attention to this match. And I'm glad I did. And I sent you a text uh, while I was watching that match um, that I debated with about sending to you because I, I didn't want to spoil anything. But I felt like it, it needed to be said. I, I sent you a text basically saying um, the, the women in this match seem to be competing to see who can become a murderer first because <laughs> they just kept on like upping the ante and hurting each other worse and worse and worse. So it was incredibly entertaining. And I, I would agree with you. It was kind of the surprise highlight of the night. Yeah, it's. And you know what? I would like to see those matches in, in separate now. Like, they don't have to quit with the people they have now. I would love to see a Nikki Cross Asuka singles match now. I would love to see yeah. a, a a triple threat match with, with Peyton Royce and Billy Kay and Asuka now. Or, you know, maybe a fatal four way for a number one contendership uh, add in Ember Moon to go for the, the WrestleMania. Uh, takeover, which is probably the next one that they have. Uh, surprisingly good match, and and that's going to be sort of my feel for the entire podcast of just what the Royal Rumble every year reminds me that one of my favorite parts about wrestling is the actual surprise you can feel, the the actual anticipation and actual like guttural feelings of surprise and emotion that you can get. And I think that's all expounded in Royal Rumble and Royal Rumble weekend. And a lot of the things I'm talking about today are going to sort of fall under that category of feeling actually surprised and having, you know, the dopamine that comes from that as well and feeling good about it. And yeah. I, th and I think that yeah. f first match that, that women's match was the first one of the, of the 
whole weekend that was like, oh, yeah, what a good surprise. And uh, kind of regardless of what happens with uh, Peyton Kay and Billy Royce, I really like they really did a good job of making me really excited to see Nikki Cross again. Like her not really being part of the finish, her giving kind of the half smile to Asuka as Asuka was walking out uh, with her championship and, and, and Nikki Cross was just lying there on the table. Like even if Nikki Cross is not necessarily bound for another title match, uh, I'm suddenly invested in her character um, and insanity kind of a, as a whole. And I'm curious to see what they do next. Yeah, let's uh, let's move on. That's a good transition to Lowe's. My low is actually that first match. Uh, I think the opener of these NXT takeovers has really been good in, in the past. You know, it, one of you know the first Brooklyn was the Jushin Thunder Liger Tyler Breeze match, which everyone was looking forward to, and uh, they they have a tradition of having really good heating heating up matches for the first one. And I just wasn't feeling, and maybe it was the fact that I think Ty Dillinger's been in that first match for like the last 12 pay-per-views they've done. Yeah. Yeah. It it really kind of has become the Ty Dillinger Memorial match, the opener of takeovers. (laughs) It's true. It's like, yeah, he's got that. But then like, I don't know. Sanity doesn't, isn't like a group or the way they, they wrestle, the way they, they do their gimmick isn't something that's going to really inspire a lot of energy in the crowd. You know, they're, they're not going to heat a crowd up for the, for the rest of the match. They, they, they're slow. They're, they're plotting that it's like, I would never want to see the authors of pain versus (laughs) sanity because of how slow that match would be. No, no. Yeah. That sounds like the worst. Yeah. Which might be what we get next. Who knows? I just it what it it, I, it didn't vibe with me. I, I I'm not sure I can explain why. There's too much about the coat that made no sense to me in that little. Feud <laughs> they there. really really obsess over those coats. Like those coats are like, it's like the Undertaker's urn. Those coats. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's like as soon as you put on that coat, you become insane and part of sanity. Like I, that's not how that works. I guess. Uh, and it just tie has for two years, maybe now given us everything he can in NXT, but I I also don't want to see him on the main roster. So I I honestly don't know what you do with him. Maybe some sort of thing with sanity might be good for him. But at this point, I I just wasn't vibing with that match, especially at the beginning of the show. It felt in the long run of things. It felt more like, the go to the bathroom match than it did the, Oh my goodness. NXT has started. Let's do this match. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. So, so do you think now looking towards the future, do you think uh, Ty Dillinger is going to be the next member of sanity? I don't know what they do with Ty Dillinger. Like you also could say like, well, he was in the rumble. So now he's, is he on the main roster? Is he? No, 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 <laughs> no, he's not. Uh, yeah, I guess there, there feels like there's still unresolved issues there. Like he was beaten, but does that mean he's part of sanity because wrestling logic, you know, <laughs> like, oh, that was kind of the, what they were I mean, fighting he didn't, over. He didn't put on the jacket. Tay. Obviously, he's not a member because the jacket never went on. <sighs> so we'll probably get. So about... they have to have some sort of jacket <laughs> segment, a, a jacket on a pole match. Is that what's coming yeah, for yeah. NXT TakeOver? uh That's... Orlando, they they have they have a segment where Ty Gillinger comes out with his like th- like thing with the back collar on, and he's like, "I'm Ty Gillinger, and I'm ten out of ten, and whatever." And then he pulls out that, and he's wearing the sandy jacket underneath, but his his over the top jacket wasn't like full enough to cover it up. Yeah, it's like so everyone's like, you we, the, we can all tell. Jacket on yep, there. We can all tell. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't I don't know what they do. I th- I think I like sanity overall as like. A, a, a gimmick or just what they're doing. Um, uh, I love stables. I'm a big fan of stables. So they made sanity look strong throughout the entire pay-per-view. If you look at how Nikki cross was portrayed, you know how Eric young was portrayed. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Alexander Wolf and, and Killian Dane, uh, going for the authors of pain for the, the tag team titles in the future as well. Uh, 
Uh, so who knows? There there could be a moment where Sanity holds two two of the three yeah. belts in NXT. Yeah, San- Sanity like the the stated purpose of Sanity they say is is to spread chaos through NXT, and that's cool. But they need to start doing that, or it's going to be hard to take them seriously. Yeah, it's sort of like take the Samoa Joe chaos causing thing where Joe would just or the Bra- look at Braun Strowman now or. At any point, oh, Braun Strowman. at any point, I feel like they should, you could have Sanity walk in and be like, yeah, I, I guess. Like, at this point, Braun Strowman could, <laughs> could, could walk into any match. He could walk into any match and be like, yeah, I guess that's a good finish. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and I think Sanity could do the same thing. And when Samoa Joe was going after Regal and telling him about his security issues, uh, I think... Get better security! Get better security! Uh... It's just he th- – that's what they should do. They should be doing a bunch of run-ins and matches that they have no connection to. They, they shouldn't have feuds. They should just create chaos. And I, they their true feud, I think, is with an authority figure trying to keep them matched up, trying to, trying to keep them quelled and calmed. I think it would be cool, like, I, I think a good path that this could go on would not necessarily be Sanity against any one specific person, but maybe just Sanity against NXT. Like, it gets to the point where they're so chaotic, so interfering and stuff that, like, people like, let, let's assume Ty Dillinger isn't part of the group, like, people like Ty Dillinger and No Way Jose and that sort of thing have to get together to try to stop these guys. Ah, uh, faction warfare. That sounds like something I could get behind. Add some flips, and I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. Um, so that flips was it is. that's that was our high and our low. Uh, did you have a different low for? I did. I do have a different okay, low. Go um, for it's it. Not. I don't feel as strongly necessarily about it as as you did about that first match. And you didn't even really necessarily feel super strongly about no. that. It's just. When when a show is as good as that show was, things that aren't even, aren't great stand out. Um, which is why I'm gonna I'm gonna mention one third of the commentary staff again. Can you guess which one? Uh, is it Tom Phillips? Nope, not Tom Phillips. Is it Corey Graves? Oh, it's not Corey Graves. Who will miss? Is it Percy Watson? Percy Watson, <laughs> and in fairness to him, he is so new to this still, but, like, I, I, I feel like he is trying too hard, and that is becoming a detriment to the commentary crew. Um, it, it, again, in fairness, like, you're not going to get any better if you just sit on your hands and don't say anything, Otunga, but um, the, the most of the time, he contributes basically nothing to the match, and... and you, you can tell when you have a commentator who's not sure what to say because they'll say, like, completely pointless things like, oh, it looks like that one hurt, or oh, I can't believe he kicked out of that one, or something to that effect that's more of an observation than, like, an actual building commentary of the match. Um, he's not... I don't, I don't know. I, I guess I wouldn't call him terrible, uh, David Otunga, but I would say he has a long way to go and he was easily the the worst part of the show for me M- maybe if it was just something where he had only called a match or two it wouldn't have been so bad but since he was there every single match and i could probably point to one instance in every match where he had commentary that took away more than added to it it just it, it just it doesn't seem like a good fit right now and i really hope he can get his head around what he needs to do to be good but he he's not there and i have a concern that given his personality he is never going to get there yeah we'll we'll see what happens with NXT commentary going forward you know and uh, Corey graves has been NXT commentary f- for as long as i can remember and like he's gone and that uh, new Nigel McGuinness, he's coming in. He'll, I'm sure he'll be fine. Yeah. But it's just, it's, it's. I am not concerned. Nigel McGuinness is so good. I am, I am not concerned at all about the transition. I mean, it'll, it'll there'll be some growing pains, but Nigel McGuinness, I think you're gonna like a lot. Yeah, I hope so. I, I, I'm excited to see. You know, I, I was worried we were gonna get too much Corey Graves, or that that dude was gonna just burn out something fierce because of how much he's flying around the country and and getting to different places but uh we'll we'll see it, it'll have a new flavor you know nxt is now 
after this pay-per-view, a new flavor for sure. You know, you got, we're in the rude era. We're, we're in the, the new commentary desk era. We're in the authors of pain era. It's like a weird, yeah. it, it was a very transitionary, except for Asuka, who will be the figurehead of that division until she decides she's done with it. Uh, it was a transitionary pay-per-view for them. Uh, and we'll see. I'm excited to see where they're going to lead up for NXT TakeOver Orlando before WrestleMania. Because uh, they could, th- th- they're kind of wide open at this point and could start a bunch of new awesome feuds with a bunch of different people. But don't forget, because WWE has a has a rematch clause, we'll have to have to see a bunch of rematches because some titles changed. Yeah, that's true. Uh, what do you think about hashtag DIY? Like, are they? Do they just? Do they lose it? And and now what? Well, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what their future path is because I cannot imagine a scenario in which they beat the authors of pain. But uh, like, what do they do after that? Where like, where do they go? Uh, no one knows where uh, uh, the revival is right now. And like the tag team division at this point is basically DIY authors of pain revival and then random cruiserweights stuck together. Yeah. Um, and I guess we got the sanity team now too, but like, it's not a super deep tag team division at the moment. And my, my concern is DIY now is probably just going to keep getting thrown against the authors of pain and uh, beaten over and over again. Yeah. Which wouldn't be a good, not a good look for those two because they're really good. (laughs) Um, Maybe. Also, did you see the part where the authors of pain were coming out and um, uh, what's his face, uh, dummy, dummy man from the Legion of Doom, uh, Paul uh, Ellering, 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 yeah, yeah, um, where he was pulling like the little mesh net off of their heads and one of them caught <laughs> and he was like <laughs> yanking the guy's head a little yeah, bit. Yeah, there's just like it was real awkward and very not menacing. Just like, uh, can you, can you not? Uh, all right, thanks. Uh. <laughs> yeah, they um, they're they're big dudes. Uh, uh, I'm really worried we're going to see Authors of Pain, two two big dudes versus Alexander Wolf and Killian Dane, two huge dudes, and then be like... Yeah, I don't know. That's... that's It's going to be that's very punchy kicky. Heel, though, so that doesn't seem likely. I mean, it was it was obviously supposed to be uh, TM61 until the unfortunate injury happened. So, like, now... I don't know. I don't know where they go from there. Yeah. Uh, we'll We'll see. So we should we should move on though. We should yeah, move yeah. on though. We got so much to talk about. Oh, I know. Rumble, like, it's it was a big weekend. All right, your overall hot take was. F- for NXT Takeover. Go for it. Uh, NXT Takeover makes gives me it gave me optimism for the future. Like this is the first time probably since, uh, probably since I guess I'd say, Sami Zayn left, where I was like, I am. I don't know where this is going, but I'm curious to find out. Yeah, uh, mine's similar to that. Uh, it was transitionary, and it was it, it wasn't my favorite of their uh, takeover specials. Like when you think of sort of the est- that's unfair. Well, maybe a little. Well, it's it, it's unfair because they've set the bar themselves. Like if you if you look at the if you look specifically at the takeovers before the big four pay-per-views, they've set the bar themselves to be high and they just, they didn't meet their own bar. I think that they've set in basically every single other one of these types of pay-per-views. Um, it was still good. It's an incredible show. Uh, but, it, but it, it, it didn't have every other takeover pay-per-view that I've seen has had at least one of those moments where I went, Oh, I'll remember that for a really, really long time. I I, I can't think of the that moment during this pay per view, and, and so it didn't meet my standards of what I want from an NXT takeover. Still good, still very good. All right, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, so that was Saturday night, uh, and then twenty four hours later, probably uh, more like twenty two because of when that show started. We had uh, the Royal Rumble match. I am not going. Do not include the the pre-show, even though a belt was transferred in the pre-show, which is insane to me. Uh, I'm going to run down the card if that's all right, Phil. 
These are. I mean, a belt is the tag. The tag teams. Belt. It's still like, a belt. No one cares about those. It's still a belt. Yeah, no one cares about the tag. It's no one cares. No one cares. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> tag teams. Who cares? Who cares about tag teams? Just stick some random people together. They'll be fine. I do. Like honestly, it's. it's I. I don't want to dwell on this too much because we have a lot to go through. But like, since New Day lost the belts, it, it kind of has been painfully obvious that well, New Day had the belts. WWE made no effort to build the tag team division, and now that the New Day story is done, they got they have nothing. Yeah, they they rested on their laurels, and now they they've got no number two. Anyway, okay, here is the card, non pre show card for the actual Royal Rumble. First, we have. Charlotte versus Bailey for the women's championship, Raw Women's Championship. Kevin Owens and Roman Reigns uh, for the Universal Championship. Neville and Rich Swan for the Cruiserweight Championship. John Cena, AJ Styles for the WWE Championship. And then finally, the 30 man Royal Rumble match. The winner of that match will uh, headline WrestleMania. In Orlando. Uh, have a championship opportunity at WrestleMania. There's a key difference between the two. I guess that's true. Uh, okay, so with that, we'll do our highs, lows, and hot takes. Phil, you can you can start because I've got multiples just in case you take one. Cool. I'll, I'll take the obvious one. High is going to be the John Cena AJ Styles match. Yep. Uh, they they did it again. I I, I shouldn't be surprised because those are two of the best wrestlers who exist on the planet. But they did it again. They had a match, a back and forth. Both guys looked strong. They had some amazing spots. Um, and and up until the very, very end, I had no idea who was going to win that match. Uh, it was genuine edge of my seat, like paying attention to every moment, every detail. The callback to how SummerSlam ended was the perfect way to end that match. Um, if I were to say one negative thing about it, it's that if they were going to have Cena win that, they should have played up the tying the, the belt, uh, thing, the belt record a little bit more, but that, that's not the match itself. That's the buildup. The match itself was as close to perfection as maybe I have ever seen in a long, long time in a WWE ring. Um, both of those guys, they, they, they got the best out of each other like they always do, but it was even a little better than normal. Uh, Cena throwing on the, the figure four. Um, AJ kicking out of the avalanche AA again. Um, it just so many great moments. Like it, it started and it built and it built and it built and it just it made, made, to, made up to a perfect crescendo. Like it was a great match uh, and... Now, I I don't know if I ever want to see them wrestle again. Yeah, that was an insane match. And you could... I've been reading a lot about this match in the past week. And a lot of people are saying that for the first time in a long time, Cena let Styles call some of that match. It's notorious that uh, Cena likes to call his own matches in the ring. Uh, but with... People say it, it feels very... There was some... It feels like Japanese wrestling influences in the way that match was was created uh, when it comes to false finishes and sort of the storytelling and, and the arc that that match took that seem like they came probably from AJ Styles. Uh, and that's why this melch, this match melch, uh, this match felt different than their other matches because there, there was some. I think there was more influence from AJ. I think Cena now has trusted AJ to the point where he says, "Yeah, let's make a good match." And I think you're right. I don't want to see it again. Uh, yeah. It, it, how good? What? How good does it have to be if uh, if John Cena won the belt again? And I'm not grumpy about it. Like it must have been a pretty darn good match. Exactly. Like. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but they didn't go and. No one went through an announce table in that match. Am I am I remembering that correctly? They never got outside of the ropes in that match. The only those ah, so good, so good. Yeah, the the farthest they got outside of the rope is whenever AJ went to do a springboard. No one was on the floor. That that was a wrestling wrestling match. You know, it, it's incredible. And hopefully people are seeing that now. So like, okay, we don't have to use those weird, you know, through table gimmicks all the time. We can have an incredible match in the ring with the arsenals that we have. Uh, Meltzer gave this one a, a 4.75, uh, 
which is the highest WWE match in, uh, I think, like three, four years now. So, yeah, he said he said that he thought about giving it a five, but he doesn't like giving fives to things that he has to think about. So, I think that's probably a good rule in general. Um, if if you want to have the debate, Phil, we also watched Wrestle Kingdom. We saw Omega uh, versus the Rainmaker. And we yeah, saw, that match was better. We yeah, I agree. That match was insane. That was <laughs> oh, but, that, but that's unfair. Like like that was what a fifty minute match uh, with two guys who like they both needed to put it all out there, and they did. And uh, and, and in fairness, uh, it probably also helped that it was so fresh to us, right? So how uh, I'm 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 looking at the Wikipedia page. How long do you think Cena Styles was? Uh, 32 minutes. It's a, it was a 24 minute match. So they had half of the oh, time, wow. half of the time of, a uh, of Omega and, and Rainmaker. So it, it's good. The only, the only negative I see from this match is the best wrestler in the company is now floundered when it comes to storyline and feud. And I'm hoping they figure that out. After elimination, oh, chamber. but what if what if he gets to wrestle Shane McMahon? Uh, please no. He's so good. There's so many people he should be wrestling uh, that he can he can make gold up with anybody. But uh, I want to I want to see AJ versus something we haven't seen before. You know, I I you know. I, what I kind of want is I want AJ because inevitably they're going to get a rematch and he's going to lose. Um, what I want to see is, well, here's a question. If Cena loses the belt at Elimination Chamber, does AJ still get a rematch? Um, I, I think he's I think he gets one. My guess is that he'll get his rematch before Elimination Chamber happens. So this Monday, that's they have one SmackDown to do that. Did they announce or, it for this Smackdown? Tuesday? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. AJ, AJ's kind of, uh, he's got so much stuff he can do, you know? Yeah. There's yeah. any, so, so what I, so what I was kind of hoping for was, um, AJ, AJ gets upset. He's, he's not the champion, but he wants a challenge. So he goes to Shane and is like, e- I want everyone, everyone who doesn't have a match for WrestleMania, put me in a gauntlet match and I want to fight every single one of them. Huh? How about that? How about them apples? I, I would. Okay. You got me. I'm in. Or just Grand Metal League. I'd watch that match on repeat <laughs> forever. You can't just throw Grand Metal League into every single match. Watch me. Watch me. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, I. I so I'm, was that your was that your high point too, or did you want to talk about another one? Uh, I've got one more, and, and it sort of goes along with my my theme of why I love the Royal Rumble, uh, and that's surprise and intrigue and and having good feelings during that Royal Rumble match. And for me, that is embodied by Ty Dillinger coming out at number 10 uh, in the actual Royal Rumble match itself. Uh, Because we didn't get a lot of surprises. We didn't get a lot of crazy entrance. You know, Ty was kind of it. And you can look at all these reactions of the Rumble on... Uh, YouTube, and, and almost always when number 10 comes up, you hear the phrase, oh, they did it. I can't believe they actually did it. Ty Dillinger at number 10. So that was just like a really, for me, a feel-good moment just because no one thought they would actually do the obvious in that one. And I, and I think I love I loved that kind of stuff in the Royal Rumble match. That's why I love the Rumble, for, for moments like that. Yeah, you're, it, was, it was definitely like... If this were a normal rumble, I don't think anyone would like. It would be a nice, cool moment, but I don't think it would be a big highlight for anyone. The fact that there was so thin on surprises really elevated the Ty Dillinger thing. Um, I don't know. I, 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 it was neat. I wouldn't necessarily say I liked it that much. Okay, why? Because. Uh, there, there's a there's a handful of things. Okay, hey, Ty, Ty Dillinger comes out at number ten. Um, Johnny Kayfabe, 
who still believes wrestling is real, suddenly that's shattered because why on earth would the perfect 10 come out at number 10 unless someone just handed him that number? Um, <laughs> secondly, uh, like the, the whole idea is like not just to come out, but to come out and do something. And he came out and did nothing. Um, he, he, he got a little bit of offense uh, in and then was eventually like our, our, our rumble feed skipped. And we missed him getting eliminated, <laughs> and no one was really talking about it because it meant so little in the match in general. Um, and it, it just it, – now, now people are talking like, oh, is Ty Dillinger on the main roster? Is he blah, 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 blah? And I, I think that hurts him in the long run because it's like, all right, Ty Dillinger went up to the Royal Rumble. Congratulations, kid. Here's, here's the biggest point of your career, and now we're going to stop trying with you because we don't need to anymore. I, I hope that's not the case, but uh, uh, you you have to put it in the context of, of what this rumble looked like, and that was the one surprise we got. And so I I guess, but it's still it's like it's like a surprise that rank ranks seven on the on a scale of ten is the winner because all there no, there was nothing competing with it. Like it's hard for me to get excited about that. Like I, I think it was a neat moment, but it's not necessarily something I really enjoyed it was my it was my b option for my highs because he took my a option uh you you know i i know this is this is non-traditional but i will say that universal championship match was pretty darn good too like yeah for 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 what it was and what i expected i i thoroughly enjoyed it i thought the ending was uh moronic (laughs) but they actually kind of saved it a little on the next raw but it was like Pretty much every match on the Royal Rumble was good. I don't think there was a single one that I, I would call bad. There was some that maybe didn't hit as hard as they should have, but it was it was, it was pretty good. It was good, pretty good. All right, let's let's head to Lowe's. Uh, do you want to go? Okay, me first. Yeah, you you can go first on this one. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about number thirty. Okay, let's. Uh, this is also my low, so just go to town. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. You and I watched the Rumble together. This is the first time that you and I ever watched the Rumble together live. Monumentous. Uh, in the same room. Just mon- it, it's, yeah. We were super excited about it. Do you remember after Undertaker came out what I said about the number 30 person? It's going to be big or something like that? No, 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 no. I said something the opposite. I said it's got to be Kane. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Be Kane. Kane is going to be number 30. He hasn't been in the Rumble yet. Kane is a Rumble staple. And I was super disappointed by that thought. I was like, oh, man, Kane, that sucks. That's so lame. Nothing could be worse than Kane. <laughs> I was wrong. The, the I was completely hit. wrong. There was something far, far worse. Because here's the thing. Because uh, uh, the assumption when people who have lost matches earlier in the night enter the Rumble, the assumption is all of them are entering the match earlier in the Rumble. So... If if we've hit thirty and none of the people who have lost previous matches are in that rumble, then then those people are completely out of your mind. They're not even on the the radar anymore. So it was maybe the biggest surprise of the night and was tremendously deflating and disappointing for so many reasons. First of all, no one wants to see Roman win win the rumble. No one, not a single person. Uh, maybe like some five year olds out there, but they suck. Go stop watching wrestling. Go watch. Uh, uh, bear in the big blue house if that's still a thing it is uh, not. secondly it's not okay secondly like you, you have you have an order where where uh, uh brock lesnar's already out goldberg comes out at 28 undertaker comes out at 29 <laughs> holy cow you're building up to something at 30 this had better be pretty darn good and so like i'm sure in your head and the head of most of the people watching that show you're running through the options you're back in the back of your head oh is it gonna be joe oh is it gonna be finn oh is it gonna be some other crazy uh, kurt angle is it gonna be some crazy return i didn't expect so there i'm sure every single person who was watching the rumble even me with suspecting kane had some level of hype for who it could possibly be and roman coming out which was neither a surprise nor a desire was just infinitely deflating and the sad thing is like you can almost put a pin in it and guarantee he was in there so that he could lose he put it yeah they put roman in the rumble so that when he didn't win the rumble we wouldn't have another rumble ending in booze people would be so distracted by the fact that roman won that they wouldn't have time to boo the fact that randy orton won 
So I, I, I just, it felt manipulative. It felt misplaced. It felt like unintentionally like hilarious in a way. And it was just, I, I don't un, like the only rationale I can think of other than, you know, not having Randy Orton booed when he won is legitimately like giving a metaphorical middle finger to, to your audience saying you don't like Roman screw you. Here's Roman deal with it. He's never going away. So it was, and the, the rumble in it of itself was not super great leading up to that. It certainly had moments, but from, I'm going to say, I don't know, around number 11 or so, you just had a bunch of guys coming in who are obviously just standing around waiting to be fodder for the big three part-timers who were coming in. And your, your last hope was someone coming in at 30 who you genuinely wanted to win the rumble. And that didn't happen. It turned out to be the person you wanted the least. So what a what a big, big old middle finger to all your audience that was. And and I I, I feel even slightly bad for Roman because once again they've put him in a situation where he is inadvertently the biggest bad guy in the company. It's they they use their own. They have a history of thirty being a prestigious sort of. Like, this is going to blow your socks off, sort of. It, it, just look at last year. Like, we all knew Triple H was going to be number 30. However, storyline-wise, we didn't. And it was supposed to be this big, you know, even then he got a big pop. You know, that 30 position is so coveted. And, and that history of surprise 30s, of people you don't know, you know, who haven't been told, you haven't been told are in the Rumble is is a history a long lineage of incredible pops and incredible returns and you just if you go if you go and watch youtube reactions if you go if you experience this live everyone went through the exact same motions they're all doing the math you know we're con- we we were constantly keeping account in our heads and in our minds and on our hands of, okay, so we, we still have Goldberg. We still have Undertaker. We still have Lesnar. They've all said they're going to be in it. So, you know, so we still have a uh, one that we don't know. And so we're, we're adding that anticipation more and more. And when you find out that that person you don't know is the last person in the rumble, your hype level goes through the roof and they should know that they know that that's what's going to happen. They should know their audience by then. And as soon as that stupid burner hit, it, it was deflating. It completely destroyed any any thoughts that I had about not just the Rumble match, but the entire pay-per-view at that point. Because now all I can think about when I think of this Royal Rumble entire pay-per-view is Roman Reigns coming out at 30, not really selling any of the vicious no disqualifications match he had with Kevin Owens and then dumping Undertaker out. Like that's all I'm going to remember from this entire pay-per-view, which is a shame because like we said earlier, everything else in the pay-per-view was incredible. It was a really, really, really good pay-per-view and it just died as soon as number 30 hit. And that's disappointing beyond all belief. Yeah, And I, as far as the Rumble goes, I wouldn't even necessarily say the Rumble itself was super spectacular up to that point, but it, it had a it had a window, had an opportunity to 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 be really good, and it chose not to be. It it willfully chose not to be. There was complete potential, depending like that thirty spot was really the hinge that teeter tottered that entire match, good or bad. You know, the difference between Roman coming out and the difference between, you know, those names that you mentioned earlier, a a Kurt Angle, a Finn Balor, a Samoa Joe, who we we now know was very capable of entering at that point. Uh, That was the teeter-totter of the entire pay-per-view, and they botched it. They completely botched it. As someone who can't handle more Roman, it was a complete and utter failure that it, we ha- I had been so hyped for months to watch this rumble with you and to experience that that time together and it it like it tore me down in a way that 
I can't really describe, but it was it was so disappointing and so willfully ignorant to what yeah. the fans clearly wanted and and what was as they've said a hundred times, best for business in that situation. I, I think you're giving them too much credit by calling it ignorance. I think it was intentional. I, I, I 100% think they knew what they were doing, and they were like, we, we, we don't need a big explosion for this last entrance. What we Our main goal this year is to not have the winner booed out of the building at the end of the night, and we've come up with a way to do that and screw everything else. And then, like... He, he, how is he not a heel? Like he had the most heat in the building, and then you make him do the thing that's going to garnish the most heat out of anything else, and that's toss the Undertaker over the top rope. Like Taylor, Taylor, I don't think you don't understand. It's the big dog's yard. So, so we're getting Roman and the Undertaker and at Mania. Then is that a thing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, probably. Or no, no, it might. It's probably still Roman Strowman. I don't know. Like, sadly, the the most unknown, interesting storyline going forward is we don't know who Roman's going against. Oh, gosh, that. Uh, let, let's go to hot takes. So, what I, was your low point? Well, that, oh, oh, that was that, your low that point was too? low. Oh, I think very clearly, I, I've made a point to understand that that was the Good. low point of that pay per view. All right, can I briefly t- touch on one other thing? Please do. The winner of the Royal Rumble, Randy Orton. Randy, number two guy in the company for over a decade, Orton, who does not need a Royal Rumble victory, um, who does not uh, need to be put over any more than he is. Like, they, like they've they been chanting RKO at him ever since he went into SmackDown Live. Like, he is, he is over. He is popular. He is never going to stop being popular. Um, he is, hang on, uh, one, two, three, three, th- the third or fourth year in the row. Right? Basically, since Roman won, every winner of the Rumble since then has been someone who has already won the Rumble. And I I just, when, when Roman tossed uh, Roman, I'm sorry, when uh, Randy tossed Roman out of the, the ring, and, and I know that 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 was like perfectly calculated and calibrated to make my reaction be oh thank goodness Roman didn't win thank you thank you uh, uh, Randy Randy you're the best he got tossed out of the ring and my first reaction was well I'm not happy about any of this <clears throat> so I, I just like uh, Randy doesn't need it like give that give that prestige to someone else like the the rumor going about is that it's Randy Bray for the uh, uh, for the WrestleMania match, and as, as I'm definitely biased towards Bray 100%, but how much more interesting would it have been if Bray Wyatt had won that Royal Rumble instead of Randy Orton? There, there are so many storylines like that were good in the match. Like the Bray and Luke Harper thing might have been the best part of the of the Rumble when you think about it. It, it when Luke set. Bray up for the sister Abigail. That was cool. That was really cool. But then it didn't mean any anything towards the rumble itself. It, it, we'll see. We'll see how Elimination Chamber goes. Let, let's go to a hot take. Let's do it. Uh, my hot take is uh, basically what we've already been saying that this pay per view was great until they tried to land the plane, uh, and then the plane. <laughs> The plane started on fire and just crashed to the ground from the thousands of feet that we had gone up, you know, going through the Kevin Owens match, Neville winning his first cruiserweight championship, the Cena Styles match, and we got to the end and we plummeted to our absolute pay-per-view death at the end of it. Uh, it was, and then Roman Reigns walked out of the plane wreckage. He held up a single fist and said, "Believe that, I'm not a good guy. I'm not a bad guy. I was the pilot, and I'm sorry." Uh, <laughs> and so that it had such potential to be a really good pay per view, and then sort of the whole Rumble match itself crashed it to the ground to make it a sort of disappointing pay per view in general. That's that's what I got. 
All right, my my hot take is fairly similar. Um, this is the rumble that has had the potential. In, like, it's been a long time since a rumble has had this much potential to be maybe one of the best rumbles of all time. Like no one knew going into that match who was going to win it. There was there was half a dozen or more potential victors of that 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 seemed reasonable. Um, they they had such an opportunity to stick a landing and make a rumble that people would remember for decades. I don't think it. I don't think it ended up as a bad rumble. I think it ended up as an okay rumble. I think this is going to be. Uh, I think this is pre- pretty much exactly as good as last year's was. Like there were good points, there were bad points. There's going to be a couple of moments that people are going to remember for a while. Uh, but in the end, this rumble is going to be remembered as a meh rumble, which is super sad because it had the potential to be one of the best rumbles of all time. Yeah, that potential was was huge. That I think what happened is we hyped it, it got hyped, and they and they just didn't meet our hype levels. We and, uh, yeah, and normally I'm normally I'm against hype yeah. and Mojo Riley in gen in general, but <laughs> uh, like this year they they intentionally built it up that way. They intentionally made us think that this is a rumble with like oh Goldberg could win, Brock Lesnar could win, Undertaker could win, uh, maybe a returning person like Finn Balor or even Samoa Joe getting called up can win. Like these these are maybe maybe not Finn and and Joe. Like that was probably on us the fans building that up in our heads, but like we were given several legitimate potential winners uh and you know it it ended up being someone that like no one was even thinking of which has the potential to be exciting but it was someone who needed it the least out of anyone in that rumble match and yet was the odds on vegas favorite to win the royal rumble for some reason yeah someone knew something that we didn't yeah for real yeah just i'm just i'm gonna just try to remember cena styles and for, and for a while and like live in that world where that was the main event of that entire uh, pay-per-view for a little bit before I can come back and think about watching Roman come out at 30 again. So that you got anything else to talk about Royal Rumble weekend, Phil? No, I want to be done with the Rumble. You want to, but do you want to remember the Rumble at all? I don't remember anything about the Rumble. I, I blacked out for How many for most minutes? Of it. Two minutes? A one minute? A minute and a half? It could, Three feet have to touch the floor? I'll, I'll call my boy Fink and we'll, f- we'll figure it out. All right. Okay. Let, let's move on to our weekly shows. We're just going to do Raw and SmackDown this week. Uh, and then we'll do the highs, lows, and the hot takes for those. Here we go. All right. We're going to go to Raw and SmackDown. Uh, Phil, do you want to start with your high for Raw or your low for Raw? Yeah, actually, um, my my high for Raw might surprise you a little bit. Okay. My high is one Mr. Braun Strowman. Okay. Uh, Braun Strowman had kind of a a peak Raw on Monday. Like, I, I really liked almost everything he did from him coming out and confronting Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho to... In kind of the biggest surprise of the night for me, rationalizing his attack on Roman Reigns the night before in a way that made sense. <laughs> Kevin Owens had promised him a title shot if he retained, and he wasn't going to get such a thing if Roman Reigns won. Oh, that makes sense. All right, cool. Um, so, th- like, not only did I enjoy that just uh, as a segment on its own, um, I really enjoyed, like, it, it made the match the previous night better by by having that context to it now. So um, this is the first time that Braun has kind of stepped up to people who are very clearly in the main event. And I felt like, yeah, Braun Strowman belongs in the main event. That's that's all right. I'm okay with that. Um, so I, I enjoyed his, uh, his parts in the opening segment. Uh, the match itself, um, him and Kevin Owens, I enjoyed quite a bit. It wasn't exactly like like a high paced, high energy match, but um, it was storytelling wise, right? What it needed to be Kevin Owens struggling and struggling and struggling and Braun Strowman trying to be dominant, but clearly like not being used to a competitor of the caliber of, of Kevin Owens. So there was moments he, w- he seemed weaker than he has in a while, excluding of course. Um, oh no, never mind. Yeah. So yeah. So that was that um, up until, my low, which I guess we'll get to later. What was your high? 
Or uh, uh, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, uh, I think Braun experiences what I'm calling uh, the opposite of Roman effect, where he's one of those guys that clearly Vince likes a lot. You know, he's a big old monster, which Vince has always been a fan of. Uh, except for he has sort of had to work his way to this point. He wasn't put in the main event right away. He did his Wyatt stuff. He did the squash match stuff to make him look strong. He did uh, the ultimate heater match, which is with Sami Zayn, to see if that worked out. Mm. And it did. Uh, And now he's worked his way to the main event. And like you said, probably deserves it. You know, we're not mad that he's there because we've seen him work really hard the past few, like the past year in the lease. Uh, to get himself there, uh, whereas Roman's and, and just he's a always heel, there, like he should be. Yeah, he uh, yeah he like, is. Like, he's the character he should be. A big dude yeah, that people are Roman, afraid of. Who's, yeah, we're we're told we're supposed to cheer for Roman because bleh, and then Roman ends up acting like a dick to most people, right? Uh, whereas Braun just hates everybody, which is great. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he's he's a very understandable, relatable individual who is just wants to kick the crap out of everyone. And he doesn't care, and I like that. I like the dynamic that he's like. He's clearly like a force that's beyond heel face. He is. He is going. If you're in his way, he's going to kick the crap out of you. He doesn't care where your allegiances lie. Right. There's. You've got Braun on this show, and then Baron Corbin's doing the same thing on SmackDown, where it's like, I just hate everyone. And I'm not going to do a classic, I like the heels, but hate the faces. I just, I will beat you up. That's my thing. I'm going to beat you up. And why does Braun want championships? No one knows, but he does. So we'll let him go. Let him go. Uh, So now my high for Raw uh, also plays into my love of surprise what i wanted from the royal rumble and that's that very last segment of raw this week with triple h coming out and cutting just a i i think it's a fabulous promo just an awesome that's promo because right, you haven't been watching you haven't been watching wrestling for a while so it would seem good to you yeah where he you know he's calling himself the creator and like even in a facebook live after NXT, <laughs> when when they were interviewing Triple H, he said, you know, like, you know, I'm the creator. I created – you come to the place where I created because Seth Rollins runs in during NXT and, you know, the Destroyer's not far behind. And even those, you know, those longtime smarky people, you know, they know like, oh, uh, you know, there's, there's two Triple H's. There's the one who comes out to this one song and the one who comes out to the other one. And basically he's call he's going to call himself the destroyer and come out with his sledgehammer and, and, and beat Seth Rollins up. Like that's the way it's going to go. But when Seth Rollins comes out and d- tries to confront him, the actual destroyer comes out and that's a one Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe, who is now Triple H's heavy, who has now officially changed his Twitter name to The Destroyer, comes out and beats the crap out of Seth Rollins. I think this is really cool. I like this a whole lot. Would I have rather seen Samoa Joe come into the Royal Rumble? Sure. But I think this is a really good way, and I like I like that maybe this isn't a going to be a triple h feud right maybe you have to get through the destroyer like the destroyer is samoa joe and i think they could really play off of this creator destroyer thing i i like it a whole lot actually just watching samoa joe strut around i I saw online that samoa joe's gotten so mad at wwe security he's become their ultimate security uh with (laughs) with helping triple h with the his whole seth rollins situation uh, that thing was awesome. I loved that whole last bit there. Uh, it was one heck of a way to set up Samoa Joe as this ultimate like destroyer. Like it, when it, Triple H could can't, doesn't want to take care of things himself, he's got someone who he thinks is even better at breaking people than him, and that's a one Samoa Joe. 
uh, I liked it a whole lot and am glad to see Joe doing some cool stuff. I'd love to see Joe going up against Finn in the main. I want to see something happen where, and and this is going to have to do some brand switching, but I want to see an AJ style Samoa Joe WWE match. They've had some killers in TNA and around the world, around the world, around the world. Uh, I'd love to see them bring that sort of vibe to the WWE in that ring. So good on it. I can't wait to see what Samoa Joe does. And I love the way they set that up. It was initially a little jarring to the idea of Samoa Joe, the big anti-authority guy from NXT coming in as for lack of a better term, a lackey of the main authority figure of the main roster. But like it, it, it makes sense when you think about it, because in, at least in the character Samoa Joe's mind, William Regal was an authority figure who was taking opportunities away from him. And Triple H comes in as an authority figure who is immediately giving him opportunities. So it's a nice little dynamic of, of what we're used to for Samoa Joe and now what we're probably going to experience coming up in the future here. So I'm very excited to see where this is going. And I think this is a good move for Joe. Uh, my only question now, the, the one thing I'm not sure about is our universal champion, Kevin Owens, who if you'll remember back about six months ago was basically handpicked by triple H to be the universal champion. Like, is there going to be a dynamic there? Is triple H going to come back and just ignore Kevin Owens? Or is there going to be something else with the two of them? Uh, like is, is Samoa Joe going to get added to the Kevin Owens mix? Or is this going to be just a completely separate thing now? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, on Twitter, Joe, he is, he is harsh. Uh, he retweeted the tweet of Seth Rollins injured knee. And he said at triple H. Yeah, I think our deal's done. (laughs) Like saying that basically (laughs) they had a contract that he was going to injure Seth Rollins and he accomplished it. Uh, so that's kind of what a guy. That's pretty good. That is pretty good, and, and we'll see. You know, maybe, maybe Joe just wants to be the enforcer. Maybe he's just sick of some of these whiny people like Seth Rollins. He just wants to beat people up, and he can be the enforcer of this weird authority group that's now forming. I guess. Or another option is maybe. This is a setup for, you know, I got my own brand in NXT and I'm going to bring them up in a weird invasion angle, which always works, uh, uh, to take out some of these, these guys who forgot where they've come from. I think it would be fun. That's, that's, that's what I would yeah. book. Because also there was a segment factions. with Stephanie McMahon, which is never a good thing in my mind, but she was bad, but not as bad as she normally is. True. So that's so that's my my high is that Samoa Joe Triple H duo, the creator and the destroyer. Uh, I just like the idea of the creator and the destroyer coming together. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was your low? Uh, my low immediately after the um, the pretty good match between Kevin Owens and Braun Strowman. It, I, I it was it, the match was pretty good. Because from the very start, you knew how it was going to end. There was only one way that match is going to end, and it is interference from Roman Reigns and the match essentially meaning nothing. Uh, So them them going with such an obvious and really disappointing end to to that sort of thing was just... uh, It really deflated me, and it it kept me from enjoying the match because you knew. You knew that that was how that was going to end. I would almost have rather he come out at the very beginning of the match and and screw it up so that they're not like stringing us along making us think that this means something when we all know that it doesn't i have no real problem with um a, a braun Strowman roman reigns uh, uh, uh program but uh, like don't insult my intelligence by pretending you're having a big match and then doing exactly what we all assume that you are going to do um, it just, I, I felt like that match was a waste of time when it could have been a major highlight of the road to WrestleMania season. How amazing would it have been even like by a fluke, by a count out or something, if Kevin Owens had gotten that win to give him a little bit of momentum because 
Tell me, Taylor, can you remember the last time that Kevin Owens won a match with no interference? Uh, could it, could it be, was it before he had the Universal Championship? Was I don't know. I feel like he had one match against, like, Sami Zayn or something just after winning the Universal Championship where there wasn't any interference, but it has been a while. A long while. And so Kevin Owens could, u- Kevin Owens could use a victory, even, like, I... Sure, a fluke victory, a count-out victory isn't a big deal, but that's that's a victory he didn't need help with, and that's what Kevin Owens needs. And the sad thing is, I, I don't think he's going to have that Universal Championship for long, and this reign is going to be completely remembered for the fact that he couldn't win a match. Like, this Kevin Owens who came in from NXT and beat John Cena clean in his first main roster uh, uh, match, like, the story of this championship reign is he couldn't beat anyone, period. So that's that's sad, and I'm getting a little off topic here. Like again, my low Roman interfering with that match, unnecessary, deflating, just like his entrance to the Royal Rumble. <sighs> and I just, I, I I hate having to sit through matches that I know will have no weight in any of the stories and have zero purpose. Like the only thing that did was move along a Braun Strowman Roman Reigns storyline that was already going forward like oh roman's angry at braun for costing him a match shocker so <laughs> no that was my low that. yeah yeah who did it's such a surprise so that was my low for raw how about you uh my low is it's one of two um it's either that seth rollins was injured during that samoa joe thing yeah uh, i can't say that could be a low that's that's really out of anyone's control yeah it, it also might not be i'm not uh it's hard to tell if it's real or not because <laughs> wrestling, uh, it's, yeah. it seems pretty real and that he's not going to be able to go for like eight weeks, but still might be WrestleMania ready. So hopefully if it, if you, if you're hurt, get, be- get better, don't come back too early. So then what I'm going to choose is anything that has to do with the cruiserweights that doesn't have the name Neville or Gallagher in it. Uh, was there a cruiserweight match that didn't involve? Yes, Tony Nice. Tony Nice fought Mustafa Ali during. Oh, I, Raw. I I remember that because I don't remember that, and I don't get it. It's not good. the The cruiserweights. Uh, there's too many of them that aren't very. They're too bland, uh, and that's just causing them to fall apart. I think that. I, I'm trying to remember how good the Cruiserweight Classic was just because they they haven't been as good on Raw. I mean, we've got definite bright spots. I mean, Gallagher was in the Royal Rumble match. Uh, the King of the Cruiserweights has his rightful belt uh, and shouldn't lose it for a year or until Grand Metalik comes. Uh, but everything else is just... Super bland. They can put on really awesome flippy matches, but there's no substance or story behind what they do, and they don't have the time to make it different than that. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's just tragic to see how f- low that they've come. When how excited we were as we were watching in the summer, uh, the cruiserweight classic. It, it's just a real shame. I mean, the cruiserweight classic. Let's be honest, cheats a little. Because when you put it in a tournament structure like that, every single match has stakes. And, like, part of the big deal is you've got favorites, and you know if that favorite loses, you might not, you might never see them again. Like, that might be it for them. Um, so, that like, it, that's immediate intrigue, immediate investment, and you don't get that on a week-to-week show. So you've got to come up with something else. And right now there's something else is throw a dart at a board with all the Cruiserweights' names on it, and whoever two we hit, they have a match, and whatever. So... It, it, some, something needs to happen in there. There needs to be some sort of, I don't know, structure for, for people uh, getting a championship match. Like, I would say that division would benefit from, like, a win-loss record thing where they keep track of that. And the people who are actually getting the wins um, are, are up there for a, a, a title shot. Like, uh, they're following sports entertainment rules, and I think they need to start making their own rules for the cruiserweight division, or it is just not going to work. Yeah, I think it needs to feel just more tournamenty. There there needs to be stakes for every match. You know, even if it's like a a World Cup type thing where 
you have your your pool of cruiserweights you're in and every win is worth one point and every loss is worth zero and then the you know four or five cruiserweights who come out of that pool have a tournament and then the winner of that tournament uh gets to go for the number one contender uh that, you're, you're you're describing the best of the super juniors. You just want the best of the super juniors. If we, I'm I'm just saying it's a it's a tried and true tournament structure, <laughs> um, that could that could work. And it also would that would take a long time. You know that's not something that could ha- that has to happen in one week. Uh, it, it could take months. It, it maybe a whole year of that. I don't know. And then have Neville just flaunting around for a year. I'd take it. Uh, but right now it's just it's floundered, it's flatlined, and it just needs some sort of pop, some sort of muster to make it better. And I don't know what that looks like at this moment. It looks like a masked man named Grand Metallic. Uh exactly. Actually, that's exactly what they need. They just need the the Metallic driver and the greatest show on earth, if you will, in Grand Metallic. Maybe you'll maybe will have a better entrance music when he comes back maybe not i know i want that to be his entrance music forever (laughs) Uh, i can't wait to hear those trumpets again uh so yeah cruiserweight's not doing great that's been like a constant low for a little while so hopefully they pick that up phil what's your hot take for raw the hot take for raw is i don't feel like we're on the road to wrestlemania i don't even necessarily feel like we're on the road to fast lane I, I felt like this Monday's Raw was just wheel spinning and solidifying things that we didn't need solidified. Chris Jericho had a had a non-title match with Sami Zayn, which you know I love. I love when champions lose. It makes so much sense that he's still a champion when he lost that match. That just it makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, Brock Lesnar coming out and challenging Goldberg to a match at WrestleMania for the least surprising thing of all time. Goldberg coming out next week. And he'll accept the match at WrestleMania, and then he'll say something like, "Oh, but I don't want it to be just any match. I'm, I'm, I want Kevin Owens for the Universal Championship, so we can raise the stakes on that, or whatever. Who cares?" Uh, and yeah, I, I, I don't really at this moment even have an idea of what Fast Lane is going to look like, let alone WrestleMania. I'm not excited, and that's sad because the, traditionally they've done a pretty good job of even after lame rumbles the the raw after the rumble having some little spice to kick up uh, the wrestlemania season and i i got none of that i got none of that i hope that uh they're able to save it because they've got time they've got a lot of time to make wrestlemania seem interesting but they are they are wasting some valuable time right now yeah uh, i have a really similar hot tape my i literally wrote down they need to start picking things up because it's WrestleMania season. Like they need to start booking long-term feuds. They need to start giving us some examples of the stakes of WrestleMania. People need to start looking good because it's, it's their playoff season now and they've got to get to the Super Bowl. Uh, and they don't have each show doesn't have that much left before they have to be at WrestleMania. Uh, and I think one show is doing a much better job than the other one at preparing themselves for their next pay per view. Uh, and that's two hundred five live. Yes, I I cannot wait for that two hundred five live exclusive pay per view. Uh, Tiny people, big world, uh, which I <laughs> <laughs> which is the name of the next pay per view. Uh, so yeah, we, we just pick it up. Raw again is getting destroyed by having three hours and having way too much filler in there. Oh my god, the three hours. Oh. Uh, it, oh, it's just too much. It's, it's just too and it doesn't help that like I had to watch what, like three different recaps of the face to face with Seth Rollins and Stephanie McMahon, where Seth Rollins bizarrely threatened to beat up children. Um You know, so, like a good yeah, guy. No, it, like a good guy does, you know that. So yeah, so it just I don't. Uh, you're right. You're right. Uh, okay, so that moves us. Let, let's talk a little bit more about SmackDown now. Uh, my SmackDown highs and lows are very overarching, so I hope you have some more specifics. I'll 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 go first this time. My SmackDown my SmackDown high is all of their A storylines, 
any of like the the top main event storylines. I'm talking about anything. The a fourth of their show was Wyatt Cena stuff, and I loved it. I ate it up. I ate up everything that started that show with Randy and Bray and Luke and even Cena and them talking about that. But the other A thing that's happening right now is setting up for the Elimination Chamber match, which was the end of the show. Uh, and that, those are really good. Like I am, I'm really excited to watch the, the elimination chamber. Uh, I've never seen an elimination chamber match and I'm, I'm really excited for, Ooh. for what this is going for what this is doing. And all of those, a storylines top notch, top of the bill, AJ styles, Baron Corbin, Miz, Ambrose, Cena, Wyatt's. They they hit it out of the park this week for that weekly show, um, because they only have two hours to fill, and that got to be most of the time. Uh, and so those A shows are really those A storylines are super good right now, and getting me really pumped. So different than what's happening at Raw, where we have no idea what's happening. Like I'm 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 hooked for what's happening with the Elimination Chamber and all of the just everybody hates everybody in that match, and it's. Mm, it's good. Yeah, I, I'm going to piggyback off of that and more specifically say that my high was the match between uh, AJ and Dean. Um, it, it, it It's a testament to how good those guys are that I was interested in a match that really didn't have stakes, really. Like, I, I've been complaining a lot about matches with no stakes th- during just this podcast, but that was a good enough match um, that I was okay with it because it didn't need stakes. It was building the 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 tension, the storyline for the chamber. Like here's two guys in the chamber. They're gonna kick the crap out of each other because they want the other guy to be less than a hundred percent for the chamber. Here's two guys um, for the chamber on commentary. They're gonna get over how like for the chamber it's everybody versus everybody. Two heels going after each other on commentary um, during during that main event match. So the match itself was good. Setup for the chamber was good. I, I felt. It was the opposite of Raw, where it was like, oh, I want to see all these guys fight in Elimination Chamber. Good job. So that was um, that was good. And I'm actually going to use that as a, as a segue into my low as well, because my low also happened during that main event. Um, do, you have a, do you have a guess, Tay? Do you have a guess what my low was? Uh, was it that a, a champion lost? That's all right. That wasn't a, I wasn't happy about that, but that one thing didn't ruin the whole segment for me. There was one thing that every time it happened, I I physically cringed, and that was Baron Corbin on commentary. Oh, okay. Um, Baron Corbin has actually done a done a decent job um, of improving himself. He's replaced belly shirt with uh, belly be- belly face with wolf shirt, uh, and that's a vast improvement. The obviously. greatest obviously, gimmick wolf change shirt. of all time is is wolf shirt. Wolf shirt Hall of Fame 2017, obviously. I mean, although, um, so <laughs> so I've actually enjoyed Baron Corbin for what he is for the last I don't know month or two now. Um, but man, did putting a microphone in front of him and trying to have him ad lib stuff really like really highlight his weaknesses like it didn't help that he was with Miz arguably the best person on the microphone um maybe in the company right now like Miz was 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 making comments about the match while also pointing out to Corbin like you haven't done anything I've done this I've done that I'm so good you're so bad why are you even here bada bada ba and and Corbin's responses like reminded me of like a like a fifth grader on the playground trying to like like come up with with insults back but it's just not able to get it like like oh like like Miz would would say things like I've I've already been in an elimination chamber like I know what it's like you don't know what it's like and Baron Corbin would like just kind of mutter a reply like oh but but how will you react when I win this elimination chamber it's like good yeah nice Baron good addition there um it's like like I headlined WrestleMania and and Baron's like yeah well I'm going to win the Elimination Chamber. It's like, ah, 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 it, it was just so bad. It was so bad. And it, how, it how did really, he, like... How did he not mention the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal? He, he did. There there was a couple of points where he did... Oh, wait, no. I might be thinking of the SmackDown before, where it was before the Royal Rumble, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Oh, okay. Um, 
But no, yeah, Baron Corbin on commentary was just... It, it showed that he had miles to go. He said things with zero energy, but not even in like that I don't care sort of style in the I, I don't know what to say, so I'm going to say some, the first thing that pops into my head, which is going to have pretty much no substance, uh, and I'm going to add nothing to this. Like, he, he just he floundered immensely on the commentary desk, and I've been told he's had good talking smack segments, so I don't know what the problem was. Maybe he was just overwhelmed by how much better The Miz was than him, but he was not verbally holding his own, and frankly, he shouldn't really be in, be in a position where that's what he's doing. Like, he's the big, intimidating, I eliminated Braun Strowman from the Rumble guy. He should be speaking with his actions, not his words. Right. So I really hope we do not see him on a microphone um, anytime in the near future. Yeah, he's uh, he's sort of been like Braun, where I really didn't like him at NXT, but now I'm like, yeah, I, I'd love to see Baron in the the uh, elimination chamber match. Like, I, Wolf shirt, I think, is the the major tur- turning point for him. Like, even I, like all joking aside, for some reason, once he put that Wolf shirt on, he got. He was better. Like, that's the point where yeah, he started getting yeah. better. Like, there's probably no connection whatsoever, but it's kind of – the timeline is kind of there where as soon as he put that wolf shirt on and I start, stopped looking at his hideous belly, uh, <laughs> I was like, I got to see the wrestler instead of the belly face, and it's actually pretty good. And the fact that he just destroyed everyone in the ring afterwards and then – stared down AJ Styles that that was a good end to to that and again I'm excited to watch the elimination chamber match I I cannot wait for that pay-per-view at this point um going into my low my low sort of piggybacks off of my high where I said I liked the a plot lines the B, the B plot plot lines are really bad Phil they're really bad think about what's happening with Carmella and James Ellsworth Think about the fact that Nikki and Natalia are still happening, and think about the fact Nikki and Natalia. I'm not. I'm, 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 Nikki and Natalia is all right. I don't mind that. Okay, th- this is me, me and Nikki Bella. Like they, they kept like. I'm yeah. not saying it's blow you away, amazing, but it, I wouldn't. I would. I would take that over most of what's happening on Raw. But, but would you? You take it as like, what is going to be probably the top women's feud in the show because we didn't see Alexa bliss. We didn't see Becky Lynch. It, uh, that was the top women's feud. And we, and the Carmella stuff is, is, is also pretty bad with James Ellsworth. What? But James Ellsworth and she keeps beating jobbers and James Ellsworth. And the, the, the other B storyline that is just kind of not a storyline whatsoever is the tag division is just kind of oh my gosh yeah for for another month what happened with that for another month in a row the tag division is going to be let's throw every single one of the tag teams together and then just have them do one match even just taking what happened on the the on, on the show like you had the weird like I don't. I don't know what even was that match like. I, what was the purpose? All of, of the it? tag what teams were out, and and then I looked up and it was just American Alpha and uh, uh, Rhino and Slater, and I was like, oh okay, so so this is gonna be a match now. And then American Alpha's music started playing and it was over, and I was like, what? <laughs> what is this match? And then they're gonna do a tag team turmoil match in the for elimination chamber for the belts. Which is and American Alpha volunteered to be the first one, and I like that. That's good. Yeah, but it, but once again, it's another large amount of people tag team match. Like, what? I don't remember the last time it was just like a one on one SmackDown Live tag team match, and it was back in the tournament, I think. Yeah, it's just ooh. I, I, uh, do they not trust American Alpha to do an like? I don't get it. Like they could have a really good one on one match. American Alpha has proved it with the revival and everything they've done in NXT, but they just keep going into these multi team tag team matches. But 
I I think the big issue is American Alpha just by by way of storyline structure is so much better than all the other tag teams right now that it's not realistic. Like they've they've shot themselves in the foot, um, and that's like they have some good tag teams. Uh, uh, Tyler Breeze and Fandango is a good tag team that they've done nothing to make seem like a serious, credible threat. The Ascension is a good tag team that they've done nothing to make seem like a serious, credible threat. Um, the Usos are also there. So there's options. <laughs> like, it's just, I, I feel like they've devoted so much time to the belts. Like, even though the women's division has some some undercard feuds, uh, the the tag team division doesn't. Like, it's, it's basically, you're either the champs or are you going off the ch- after the champs? And if you're not one of those two things, then enjoy sitting in the locker room. It's uh, it's a weird time to be in the tag team division for either show. I think like that, like tag teams. For how good tag teams have been in NXT, the main roster tag team scene right now is not interesting in at all. It's not that they're not good. It's just. There's nothing interesting about what's happening there. Uh, so let's 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 bring that to our hot takes, Phil. Hot takes of SmackDown Live this week. What do you got? Uh, hot take for SmackDown is, um, I think in two weeks this brand is going to more do more to hype up an elimination chamber than maybe any elimination chamber hype I've ever seen. Like the amount of stuff they did just this week, and now they only have one more week to continue to hype it up. I am already super excited to watch that show. Um, kudos to them for doing a good job on that. Uh, I am looking forward to the Elimination Chamber. I'm excited. I can't wait. Um, SmackDown's just a it's just a better show right now in every regard. Yeah, I, I basically said the same thing. I'm really excited to watch that Elimination Chamber match. I think it's going to be really interesting. Also, because who knows who's going to win that? Could be Bray. Could be, I mean, if Cena's still champion. It's Ta- Taylor, let's say hypothetically John Cena does not win that match. Okay. How is he eliminated from that match, do you think? Uh, is Randy in the Elimination Chamber match as well? No. No. Okay. It's uh, Cena, Bray, uh, AJ, Dean, Miz, and Baron Corbin. I think it's going to take multiple people. I don't know what the the grouping is, but I think multiple people will have to get together to eliminate him. So you're thinking like, let's say Cena. Uh, well, he would no, he would eliminate someone if he's. Let's say Cena is the third person in, and no one gets eliminated. So he comes into the chamber, and there's four other guys, and they're all like, "That's freaking John Cena. Let's gang up on him." And he takes like a finisher from all of those guys, and that's it. Yeah, what uh, like a phenomenal forearm. Right into the arms of Bray Wyatt, who does the sister Abigail, uh, and then that that would pro- that actually that those two spots together would be kind yeah. of pretty cool. I I could also feasibly imagine a situation where um, AJ Styles and John Cena just go after each other so hard that they um, they don't necessarily eliminate each other, but they wear each other out so much that the other guys come in and eliminate them when they're all done beating the crap out of each other. Um, what I really hope does not happen is I really hope Randy Orton does not interfere in that chamber match at all. I despise, with one exception, I despise when outside interference happens at Elimination Chamber because it it's it has to be so convoluted for that to happen that it usually makes no sense. The only exception, and this was super convoluted too, but it was awesome, was the time that Shawn Michaels popped out from under the ring and super kicked The Undertaker <laughs> so that um, they could set up that WrestleMania match. That was all right. I, I'm okay with that one. But like the time when Randy Orton won the chamber and Daniel Bryan was the last guy and there was a super convoluted moment where like – Oh, they have to open up the door to let someone out, and then Corporate Kane comes out, and Corporate Kane's interfering, even though it's a chamber match, and that's dumb. It's just dumb. No Randy Orton, please. Yeah, no interference. Just let these guys have a match. Like, when you look at who's in it, like, let them tell the story of that match. I- I'm excited just to watch it. Uh, don't do anything tricky or, or try to swerve us in any way. Just let that match be that match. It- don't... don't f- mess it up it, it's been set up so well just don't mess it up i'm looking at you roman reigns at number 30 like darn it it, it could happen darn it darn it darn it just keep going i'm gonna keep singing this okay and 
Mr. As is the tradition in anything WWE, when you hear Roman Reigns' music, that means the end has come. So, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you so much for listening to the Royal Rumble Brothers of Deconstruction. Roman Reigns, I enjoy. We are the Brothers of Deconstruction, and if you would like to follow us, please follow all of our Busted Zipper places. Busted Zipper on YouTube, Busted Zipper on Facebook, Busted Zipper on Twitter. Uh, feel free to, in the future, send any questions you have to us at BustedZipperWrestling at gmail.com. Busted Zipper Wrestling at gmail.com. My name's been Taylor, and the guy singing is my brother Phil, and this has been the Brothers of Deconstruction. Thank you, everybody. Roman Reigns, he's the worst.